When you enter the pretty little village with its richly ornate houses and its temple to Palandial at its center, you can see an angry mob some distance away. The villagers are hassling a young woman, insulting her and pushing her to the ground. You push your way through the crowd of people and stand in the way of the villagers. What's going on here? A man dressed in richly decorated vestments looks you up and down. Pelandia will be with you, dwarf. It is none of your business, but this woman here is a thief. She and her henchmen have emptied the monastery's granary and were willing to abandon us to our fate. That's a lie. We asked for help and these people turned us away. I came back to ask again. Tell us what happened. The villagers grumble, but the priest gives the woman a chance to defend herself. My name is Tavia. I was forced to flee Tabayin with my family when the parish land began to spread. My husband, he... We had to leave him behind. The horror in the woman's eyes gives you a good idea as to what became of her husband. No one accepted us in the north. There are too many refugees and everyone is scared. Queen Wei has offered land in Wei and to anyone who will work hard for it. But what should we grow if no one will sell us grain? We offered a fair price, but Father Malin... She darts a scathing gaze at the priest. He wanted double the amount. The priest glances briefly at the angry villagers. Then he replies in a firm voice. It was a hard winter. And, with the increasing frequency of orc attacks, we must think of ourselves first and foremost. Even we cannot help everyone. The bystanders mutter in agreement. Let the woman go. The priest looks at you in astonishment. He is not used to being given orders. But before he can reply, you step towards him and beckon him down to you. If this is the woman behind the robbery, then she might lead us to the loot. Now, what is more important to you? To see the woman hanged here and now, or to get your grain and supplies back? The priest looks at you taken aback. He clearly hadn't expected such cleverness from a dwarf. After short consideration, he nods. Hmm. Let the woman go. Dissatisfied grumbles come from the crowd, which the priest tries to dampen with appeasing gestures. That is an order in the name of the goddess! The woman gets to her feet. A passage opens between the group of villagers. She looks at you in reflection for a moment. Then she nods and leaves the square at a controlled pace. Namora, find out where she's heading and then rejoin us. Fergus wants to raise an objection. But before he can think of the right words, Namora has kissed him on the mouth and has disappeared round the next corner. I hope you know what you are doing. The priest's scrutinizing gaze lingers on you and then he leaves. The crowd slowly disbands. The priest is lost in thoughts, standing in front of the temple, as if he couldn't decide whether to go in or not. I was wondering, what was here first, the temple or the village? Ah, a keen eye. The temple is indeed much too big for such a small village. It was built on the foundations of an old stronghold when salt was found nearby. The village has grown over the years in the shadow of the temple. Good people live here, honest and pious children of Philandio. He glances at the place where the woman was surrounded. Why can't we just be left in peace? Supposing Tavia really did steal the grain and supplies, but only to save her family. Would you turn a blind eye? Palandio teaches generosity, but that too must have its boundaries. We cannot help everyone. At some point, there won't be enough for us. So, if you had sold the grain, the people of Seaton would have starved? Maybe not. Not yet. But if we always give everything we have away... No one is saying always, and no one is saying everything. The priest shrugs his shoulders apologetically. He doesn't wish to spoil things with his flock. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to find the thieves' hideout yet. 
please hurry. People are getting restless. They want justice. You nod goodbye, and the priest returns the gesture. You enter the village's large storehouse. The ground floor of the two-story building is full of turnips, with large barrels and clay pots on the floor and on high shelves. Several villagers are carrying out stock-taking. They're being supervised by a weedy man who observes them with a grim expression and writes things on a wax tablet every now and then. Work is in full swing. The man with the wax tablet grumbles now and then in agreement when one of the peasants shouts out a number to him. It shouldn't take too much longer until they finish the inventory. There are sacks piled up on top of one another on the first floor. They are most likely filled with different kinds of grain and, judging by the omnipresent white dust, flour. You look around for a portable source of light. Can anyone see a candle or a torch? I need a light. I wouldn't recommend that. The Magister Technicus has followed you into the storehouse. One spark could ignite the flower dust. We sometimes use the effect when we want to create huge balls of fire on the stage. I think we could do without huge balls of fire in here. You walk towards the only area in the storeroom where you can see the floorboards. You hesitate as your boots slip on the floor, as if you're walking on mud. Tungdil. The Magister Technicus carefully observes the roof beams above the empty corner. He grabs at a beam and crumbles something between his fingers. You can't make out what it is, so you copy him and feel damp, rotten wood. It's very easy to pull away small pieces. What are you doing here? The man with the wax tablet is standing on the stairs. He sounds half angry, half shocked. No one is allowed in here! Who are you? What are you doing here if no one is allowed to be here? I'm allowed to be here. It's my job. I'm the steward of the temple. Morris is my name. The rain has gotten here. The roof and the floor are damp. Those oh, savages! It wasn't enough that they steal from us. They had to damage the roof, too. That was probably where they got in. The wood didn't start to rot yesterday, good man. The steward's face turns bright red. And you are the experts on such things, are you? Assuming the roof here has been leaky for a long time, what would have happened to the grain in the sacks directly underneath? Wouldn't it have turned rotten? The man wets his lips. His gaze darts around the room. The roof was fine. I'll have it repaired. And now, get out of here! The steward angrily blocks off all further attempts at talking to him, and even when you threaten him with Father Malin, it doesn't have the desired effect. The father trusts in him, he says, and he's always been a devout follower. The heavy door of the storehouse closes behind you, and you hear a bolt sliding into place from the inside. The priest is lost in thoughts, standing in front of the temple, as if he couldn't decide whether to go in or not. The roof of the granary is leaky. We saw some rotten wooden planks. Again? Morris only had the roof repaired last summer. Did he? If he didn't, some of the grain would have got damp and rotten. Out of the question, Morris would have reported that. He checks the grain once a month and there were no complaints. The priest has absolutely no doubt in what he is saying. Often a sign that someone hasn't thought things over. You nod goodbye and the priest returns the gesture. Like every night in the wilderness, you set up camp and assign the watch. Bavrigor takes first watch this evening, while the rest of you sit by a small fire, toasting some bread. You are not particularly surprised that neither Bavrigor nor any of the others notice the guest who suddenly appears out of the darkness next to you. Nomura! Fergus jumps up, and moments later has embraced her tightly. Were you able to find out anything? She didn't detect me and led me straight to the hideout. I can show you. It's a cave some miles off from the path. Almost four dozen people, men, women and children. You nod. You have tracked down Tavia's hideout. 
When you enter the strongly fortified mountain village, you see a large group of miners standing around a shaft in heated discussion. But I really saw them, I swear! A young man in mining clothes defiantly stares at an older man who is a good head taller than him. Even if you did, smashing the lift hoist, it would have been better to have not sent the cage down again until we cleared this thing up. Is there a problem? The older man, perhaps a foreman, is so angry that he hardly seems to have realised that he's talking to a dwarf. Mika here says that he saw orcs in the mine, and he smashed the lift hoist to bits. The cage has crashed to the bottom of the shaft. How are we supposed to work now? Can we help you somehow? Help? Well, we'll have to repair the hoist, and we need a new cage. The foreman turns to a man next to him for answers. He's just as muscular, with dirty, calloused hands and an angular face. It will take at least two weeks, but we don't need any help, unless you can speed up time. I'll need one day. Two at the most, if there are problems. The foreman looks aghast at the Technicus, unsure whether he's joking or not. One day? Have you got any idea how... Fergas is the most talented Magister Technicus in Girdlegard, and anyway... What have you got to lose? Let him help. Well, as long as he doesn't get in my way. The worker shrugs his shoulders. Why not? Good, we'll help you. And we don't want anything in return. Ooh, that's generous. The foreman looks at you distrustfully. He's the sort of person who doesn't like being indebted to others. Fergus immediately gets to work, examining the hoist. After a few moments, he sends Mika off with a list of tools and spare parts and explains to you how to build the cage, while he takes care of the hoist's rustic mechanism. After half a day, the cage is operational again, but Fergus is still busy with the hoist. You just hear him muttering. So far, there is no automatic break in case the ropes snap, but it shouldn't be too hard to fit one. Fergus decides to fit the automatic break but it takes more time than expected. Building the hoist from scratch would have been simple, but the upgrade turns out to be complicated. In the end, it takes two days until the lift is operational again. After the work is done, you report to the foreman. A huge grin spreads across the foreman's face. You have just saved him a lot of time and effort. We can't let you leave empty-handed. Here, at least take some provisions for your journey. And if you ever need some extra brute force against the orcs, I'm sure we can find ten men who'd be happy to learn from you. People here, so far away from civilization, know how to look after themselves. The men have broad shoulders, strong hands, and look as though they'd know how to fight off orcs. However, you can't persuade them to join in the attack with you. There are too few here. The orc camp is huge. Organize some more help, then we'll come with you. You travel down into the mine in the repaired lift. Mika shows you the place where he saw the orcs, and you follow the winding gallery. After a thousand paces, you stopped counting, and only after several hours do you reach an exit. There's a stench of tallow in the air. The tunnel leads directly into a huge orc camp, which blocks the pass into Snowdale Valley. If you attacked from here, you'd have the element of surprise on your side. I could go and take a look, and perhaps improve our chances for an attack. You remember how the actor had transformed himself into Lot Yonin and Nudin in Mephidania? You certainly wouldn't bet against him being able to walk through the Orc camp unnoticed. I'll come with you. If I stay in the shadows, they won't see me. The actor nods gratefully. I'll come too. I also know how to keep myself hidden. Nomura wants to object, but you are quicker. Thank you, Geralda. Two more eyes and ears would be helpful on such a mission. You spend the night protected from the wind in a ruin, 
and is sitting around a campfire as the topic of your new companion's performance on the stage comes up. Sleight of hand, speed, alchemy and makeup can have an incredible effect. Namora transformed herself into an alf using the latter. I also noticed your weapons, Namora. I've never seen such swords before. Their names are Crescent and Sunbeam. I designed them myself. It took a long time until I found a smith who was able to make them. She looks like a pointy ear too. Nature hasn't been kind to her. For this absent-minded remark, Boindil receives evil looks from Nomura and grins from the men. Perhaps I really am an elf and will bring you a nightmare in your sleep tonight. Don't be surprised if you wake up screaming. For a moment, it seems as though she has merged with the darkness. But when you blink, everything is back to normal. By the gods! Isn't she magnificent in her role? There is no denying what Rodario says. The group isn't overly friendly towards Geralda, and this evening she's sitting once again apart from the others. You ask yourself what you can do to break the ice, when you see that she has a file in her hand. The file is wrapped around with silver wire and has a snap lock. The liquid in it is black. Giralda opens the lid and takes a big swig. As she puts down the bottle, a smile flits across her face, followed by a short expression of deep satisfaction. It is the first time that you have seen a positive emotion on the face of the somber dwarf. Is that medicine? No, it's... I don't know either. If I don't drink it, I have a longing for it. It gets stronger and stronger until it... until I can't stand it anymore. When I drink it, the longing disappears and I feel rested and strong. And when the file's empty? I don't know. I don't know where I got the drink from let alone what it is. But if I don't drink it, the frackers give me strength. I think I would go crazy or die. Geralda plays with the file, lost in her thoughts, as if she were trying to remember where she saw it for the first time. A two-story tavern sits on the corner of a crossroads. The snow around the building has been cleared away and a warm light is coming from inside. The sign above the door reads, Minstrel Castle. Minstrel Castle? That sounds promising. The old building has nothing in common with a castle. It seems rather nondescript. A simple tavern for simple people. Finally! Time for ale! My throat is completely parched! As much as I hate agreeing with you, I too can hardly wait. You enter the tavern with Bavragor and Boindil in front. On first impression, the interior is as inconspicuous as the outside. But when you take a closer look, you spot a couple of paintings of minstrels in front of a castle. A small stage that, judging by the dust, is only very rarely used, and a loot hanging on the wall behind the bar. There are not very many guests on the ground floor, perhaps a dozen, and most of them belong to a group of mercenaries who have retreated into the far corner. You sit at a table, and after a while you are brought the ale that Boindil has ordered. You go to the bar where the landlady is working and sit on a stool. The landlady, a stout, middle-aged woman with long hair tied in a ponytail, looks up briefly but says nothing. Say, why is the tavern called Minstrel Castle? It doesn't look much like a castle. Oh, you don't know the legend, dwarf. <laughs> One of the guests next to you at the bar takes up your question. There was a castle here once. No one knows its name anymore. So everyone just calls it Minstrel Castle. Once upon a time, a king lived in that castle. He had many subjects and an enchanting queen. But one day a young minstrel came along and sang of wonderful far-off lands, and the subjects began to complain about their own lives. 
So the king sent for the singer to hear for himself. He came and sang a wonderful love song, and the king began to be scared. He thought that the minstrel wanted to steal away his queen. Without flinching, he drew his sword and struck the boy down. His father heard of this. He was himself a singer. And so he went to the king and played a terrible song, a curse. The king was to vanish in silence and no one was to remember his name. And that's what happened. No one remembers the name of the king or his castle. Make of it what you will. The story's certainly well known enough in the area to give our in its name. You nod at the landlady as you slip off the bar stool, and she nods back. Good day, gentlemen. Get lost, Grandlin. Be quiet! The good dwarf may want to make use of our services, if you stop insulting him. The mercenary immediately becomes sheepish and concentrates on his tankard of beer. My name is Gurnham, the leader of this troop. Pleased to meet you, Mr. Gurnham. I am Tungdil Goldhand. I actually do wish to inquire after your services, against an orc camp in the west. The leader of the mercenaries looks at you, trying to size you up. You and your companions look as though you know how to handle your weapons. Must be a damn big orc camp. Otherwise we wouldn't ask for your help. So, are you in? <laughs> Why not? 500 gold coins for me and nine of my men, in advance. You go back to the mercenaries. They look up briefly before turning back to their drinks. So, have you made your decision, dwarf? You send Namora to try and haggle down the price of the mercenaries. If it will help against the orcs. Hey guys, we need your help with a couple of orcs. Name your price. The men look up, and as they see who is standing in front of them, their faces brighten. Hmm, we wouldn't take money from someone like you, sweetheart. I'm sure you can show your appreciation in other ways. <laughs> Nomura says nothing. She stares into the man's eyes, and he falls silent. He seems to shrink and to have lost the capacity to talk. Finally, Nomura looks away and turns to go. All right, then. I'll find someone else. Wait, wait, stay here, darling. The young mercenary jumps up and tries to hold Namora back by the arm, but she sidesteps quickly and he grasps at thin air. He trips over Namora's foot, which just happens to be in the right place, and clatters to the floor. <laughs> oh, come on, boys. Don't you know how to treat a lady? The leader of the mercenaries smiles at Namora, revealing several missing teeth. For such a beautiful woman like you, We'll make a very special price. For 250 gold pieces, we'll demonstrate what we're capable of. Here is your payment. 250 gold coins. You place a pouch containing the counted coins on the table in front of Gurnham. We will seize the old camp with you, and then perhaps celebrate a bit? He grins over at Namora, who manages with some effort to avoid killing the mercenary.
Bavrigor and Boindil, who are absorbed in a drinking competition, have to be practically dragged out of the tavern. But in the end, you are able to continue your journey. You arrive at an empty jetty on Lake Anteria. You can see several fishing boats on the lake, and there's a small village on the other shore. Ah, Polebrook, what an idyllic little place. And then there's the miller's daughter. <laughs> hey there, would you be able to ferry us over to the other side? At first you think the fisherman hasn't heard you, but then he turns around and heads towards the shore. When the boat has almost reached you, the fisherman calls back. Dwarves, are you lost? Oh well, whatever. I am Samuel. If you wish to cross, it'll cost you. Food for ten days or twenty gold, whichever you prefer. You give Samuel the gold and, after a long discussion with the dwarves in the group, you follow him onto the boat. The dwarves literally leap out of the boat as soon as you reach dry land. We could have died! I hope it was worthwhile, scholar! As on the previous evening, Bavrigor sits apart from the others. But tonight, he waves you over. Smeralda, my sister. You want to know what happened, right? You nod and sit down. She followed Boindel into battle. We tried to talk her out of it, but she was as unyielding as a mountain. Then came the day when the High Pass was attacked. Bavrigor drinks from his liquor. He killed her. Blinded by the frenzy of battle, he thought she was one of the enemy. We can never forgive him. He killed my sister. Could you? You inevitably remember the loss of Lot Yonan, Frala, and her children. You remain sitting in silence, each of you deep in thought. Boendal approaches, having either heard you or guessing what you were talking about. His fierce life forge is a curse. He thought the orcs had robbed him of his love, and the ire came over him. Sometimes he calls her name in his dreams. Oh, he'd never admit it, but he suffers just like Bavragor. He too loved her. The stonemason doesn't react, so you and Boendal go back to the others by the fire. You can make out a cave in the bank of a dried out riverbed with several small fires burning in it. You don't see any guards, so you approach carefully. Men and women jump as they notice you. There is terror written in their emaciated faces. When a little girl screams and runs away from you, the whole camp is alerted, and a group of men and women step out of the cave. Is that them? Your benefactors? Tavia, who came out of the cave next to the man, nods. You've led them straight here. Who are you? The man resembles Tavia. His face, too, tells of a struggle between defiant determination and fatigue and resignation. I am Gerald, Tavia's brother. I led these people here from Tabayin. You look around you. You guess there are about ten families, less than fifty people. Half of them are children and youths. Your sister couldn't have known that she was being followed. Namora has quite a talent for not being seen. She shouldn't even have gone to Seton in the first place. I knew that nothing good would come of it. Tabayin is a fertile country in the north. But much more importantly these days, it borders the Perish land to the east. How are things in Tabayin? Gerald's expression changes. It's as if he's looking through you. The Perish land is raging. It poisons the spirit. And those who become possessed by it just... Gerald looks at his hands, which he involuntarily forms into claws. They no longer recognize you. 
brothers, mothers, children. My brother-in-law. I had to... With visible effort, he wrenches himself free of his terrible memories. We can only hope that the Magi manage to build a new barrier soon. You cannot bring yourself to quash the last hope he has. Tavio went to Seton on her own initiative. Our gold was gone and our supplies were dwindling, despite being on half rations. I said we should just take what we need if no one is going to help us, but my sister wouldn't have anything to do with it. She took the wedding jewellery from our village, the most valuable thing we had with us, and sold it without my knowing. She then took this money and went to Seton with several men. I was completely beside myself when I heard about it, but then they came back with food and grain and I thought they had really done it. He laughs cheerlessly and shakes his head. <laughs> For a few minutes we thought we were saved. What's wrong with the grain from Seton? We thought we finally had a change of luck for the better. We were praying for a new start, but then we discovered that most of the grain was rotten and unusable. They'd been ripped off by the bloody steward. We all got together and discussed what was to be done. The majority was in favour of going to Seton and taking what was due at any price. The next morning, Tavia disappeared. It was clear to me that she had returned to Seton. We were going to give her a couple of days, and in the meantime, we prepared for our attack. We needed weapons, and we needed a plan. The supplies and the grain, where are they? Gerald glances at your companions. The grain is mainly useless. There's only four or five usable sacks. We shared out the supplies, and that'll keep us going for the next few weeks. If you return the grain, Father Malin may temper justice with mercy. Mercy! Gerald spits at the floor. <laughs> Let my people starve so that the people in Seton can live in affluence for another year! No, I won't let my family die. The grain and the supplies stay here. Gerald braces himself, placing his right hand on his axe. We should appease the people of Seton. Give them back half their grain. You raise your hand to nip Gerald's objection in the bud. I am, of course, talking about the rotten grain. You keep the good grain, we will receive at least part of our reward, and Morris will be forced to explain how his excellent grain could turn rotten so quickly. Boindil stares at you, then a grin slowly spreads across his face. Ha! That's our scholar! You see tired but happy faces all around you. The people breathe a collective sigh of relief. We'll take half of the grain back in secret. Know this, good dwarf. Whenever you need help, we will stand by your side. We don't have much to offer you, but we can muster together a few strong arms for battle, and we have some outstanding archers. You nod, and are happy to have made some new friends. We wouldn't ask if it wasn't important, but we need your help to destroy an orc stronghold. Gerald nods. We're in your debt. We'll send our five best archers. So long, my friend. The fishing village seems as busy as ever. Samuel, the fisherman, is working on his boat again and looks up as you approach. Oh, back in Polebrook already. If you want to get over to the other side, I'll ferry you across for 10 provisions or 20 gold. You give Samuel the gold and after a long discussion with the dwarves in the group, you follow him onto the boat. The dwarves literally leap out of the boat as soon as you reach dry land. We could have died! Your path leads you once again to the Minstrel Castle Tavern. The warm, familial glimmer from inside is, as ever, inviting. You leave the Minstrel Castle behind you and... You enter Seton and take a look round. The priest is lost in thoughts, standing in front of the temple, as if he couldn't decide whether to go in or not. We have found the thieves' hideout. Really? 
That's welcome news. With an encouraging nod, the priest of Palandiel prompts you to continue. We spoke to the people there. It was very revealing. And? The priest gives you the same look he otherwise uses to reprimand the villagers' minor sins. They say they paid Morris to sell supplies and grain to them. The priest wants to object. He ripped them off. That would be an explanation as to why Tavia came back this morning, don't you think? The cogs are turning inside the priest's head. His expression reveals that he doesn't like his own conclusions. And what about the grain and the supplies? The refugees must have been very hungry. They'd already eaten supplies by the time we arrived at the camp. We were able to secure most of the sacks of grain. We'll take them to the storehouse. The priest eyes you in silence, and you look back without batting an eyelid. Very well. You have earned this, Mr. Dwarf. The priest brings out a pouch. He thinks for a moment, and then pulls another smaller pouch from his robes and gives it you. It is time that my congregation concentrates once more on the essentials in life, togetherness, and the compassion of the goddess. He leaves you standing there without another word. The village seems much emptier than on your last visit. Most of the workers must now be underground. People here, so far away from civilization, know how to look after themselves. The men have broad shoulders, strong hands, and look as though they'd know how to fight off orcs. You helped us, we'll help you. We're miners, but we know how to look after ourselves. If you want to attack the orcs, we could help you with ten men. The orc camp is still very imposing, with its hosts of orcs and robust fortifications. An attack will be difficult, but Nomura, Giralda and Rodario are prepared to infiltrate the camp and weaken it. The mercenaries, the miners and Gerald's people are waiting for your signal to attack. You probably can't expect to receive any more support. Listen, try to sabotage their defences and if you can safely take out a couple of guards, then do it. But don't take any big risks. Come back here if things get too hairy. Nomura and Rodario rejoin you without any particular urgency. The infiltration was a complete success. No one detected the two of them. You enter the Orc camp with your companions. You have a long way ahead of you.
Huh? I'm aware. Yeah. Time to get die. Yes. Yeah. Die. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. What? At your service. Mm -hmm. Huh? The victory over the Orcs was hard fought, but you have won. Not least thanks to your aides. You take care of the wounded and take your leave before you finally continue on your way into the mountains. <laughs> <laughs>